Okay, so thank you and welcome. Thank you for being with us in this uh, Friday afternoon in one of the last sessions, the parallel sessions that we have. Uh, first, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects uh, to their elders past, present, and emerging. I am Silvia Montaña. I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the center, um, and I uh, do research in the news and uh, media focus area. And today we are going to talk about uh, conversational journalism. So I don't know if you have heard this. Hey, Google. Hey, Siri. What's the latest news? So this command is now becoming a common way for Australians and people all around the world to search for news content. It embodies the growing experience of conversational journalism with automated agents. These chatbots appear to engage in personalized conversations with users and provide outputs about breaking news, emergencies, and trending topics. The appearance of a conversation is actually the result of the hard work put in by developers, journalists, and numerous news workers who operate from an editorial standpoint. They keep up with the rapidly changing news landscape by using automated and sometimes artificial intelligence technologies. The technology behind chatbots has been around for a while and has advanced rapidly especially with the introduction and popularization of OpenAI, Google Bard, Microsoft Bing, and other generative chatbots. Furthermore, the integration of generative AI into the editorial world is causing uncertainty among uh, news organizations, journalists, and media scholars. Within just a few months, the question in the field has shifted from whether to use generative AI to how to use it effectively and responsibly. So today we are very lucky to have three guests, each offering unique and enriching perspectives from different fields about their work with chatbots. They will be sharing their work and insights on what can be referred to as the second wave of conversational journalism. And without further ado, let's welcome our panelists. We have with us uh, Donat Dr. Jonathan Hutchinson. He is the chair of the discipline of media and communications at the University of Sydney, and he is chief investigator of various ARC uh, research projects. We also have Craig McCusker from ABC. He is the group product manager for Future Focus and ABC digital product. And Craig has been with ABC since the 90s when he signed on to help create the first ABC News and Current Affairs sites. We also have with us Dr. Damiano Spina. He's an associate investigator at the center, and he's also a senior lecturer and DECRA fellow at the School of Computing Technologies at RMIT University. So now you have the floor for you. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, and hopefully the microphone's working okay, as we've been told. Yes, there it is, great. Uh, it's been a few years since I've been in this room, I have to say, to, to talk, and I, you kind of forget the scale. i sort of like way up the back there. Um, so hi, everyone up the back. Hi, everyone down the front. Um, thanks for getting the panel together, Sylvia. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a treat to, to talk to everyone today about um, some of the work that's new, but in many ways, cycling through through the motions in, in, in some ways. So um, uh, it's it's interesting to be here today talking about some of these um, conversational journalism bots uh, in the context of uh, the current mode that we find ourselves in, generative AI, the explosion of chat GPT, um, and refreshing to hear some of the talks uh, over the last few days reminding us or something that I'm, I'm taking away from this, you know, reminding us that we've, we've got this. I think Jo Gray yesterday said it beautifully, and she's like, you know, we've got this, we've been through this before, this is nothing new, we're just in our new te uh, media technology phase. 
with a few exceptions, right? So um, in, in 2018, I did a, did a research project with Heather Ford, who I'm not sure is in here. Um, and we looked at the ABC News chatbot, funnily enough, with Craig McCosker. And um, uh, that, was, that, was, that was great. That was, at the time, that was sort of a, a moment of, well, this is something, like, you know, this is this public media service remit playing out within these new media technology spaces. There's a lot of opportunities here. Craig was very enthusiastic about it. Um, they'd done quite a bit of uh, their own user-based research as well, so it was really great to sort of bring our thinking to it, uh, to, to what the, the work that they'd already done as well. Uh, and and what, we, what we found through that process was it's not automation, it's really a way of um, navigating relationships between news consumers uh, and, and news editors in, in that sense. And we, we sort of distilled that down to three characteristics which were very human, you know, like very human news bots uh, in that they're unpretentious, optimistic and helpful. And this is how people were, were really seeing these news bots at the time. What we didn't realise at that particular period of, the, of, of research is, you know, this was kind of the start of what is now known as conversational journalism. Uh, and I think I had someone say it yesterday where it's not uh, artificial intelligence but artificial communication. And I think this is, that's a really solid founding um, principle on which to, to work to from there. Uh, now I've just concluded some research uh, looking at the process of digital intermediation, which is looking at the unseen infrastructures for cultural production. And in that space, there's um, three key things, that's technologies, institutions, and automation. So the intangible things, the things that we can't touch, uh, that really direct how cultural production takes place, including news in this, in this space as well. Um, and, you know, surprise, surprise, it's a relationship between, you know, technologies, humans, uh, the environments, the institutions in which they work. But they really do determine how cultural production uh, plays out within these sorts of fields and spaces. Um, and it's in, in this kind of context that <coughs> we, we need to think about this role of automation. And again, coming back to that relationship between the human la labour that's a part of this conversation. And very much in this sort of 2018 period, there was a lot of uh, heavy handedness of, of you know, humans in the background kind of responding to people, which has kind of been a thread through a lot of these the, uh, chatbots from, from there forth. But it does pose this question of you know, how conversational are these, new bot, uh, these news bots now? So we've done a little bit of, um, a little bit of research, exploratory research into sort of the field at the moment. Um, and we had a, we did a walkthrough, many of you would know this, this methodology as developed by Ben Light and others. Um, and we looked at 16 news bots who are, or that are, um, interesting, that are uh, working in these sorts of spaces. And probably of those that we, we looked at in this round, there's more research coming in right now, but I haven't, haven't got that synthesised into this presentation, looking at the broader APAC area. Um, of those news bots that we looked at here within the Australian context, Artifact, ABC News Bot, The Newsroom and Charlie were of the, the most interest and um, seemingly interactive or conversational with the users in, in many ways. Um, and so you could see that there's a couple of screenshots there just to give you an idea of you know, how they're gamifying it to try and keep you engaged. Interestingly, uh, as a bit of a side note, um, there was a strong, um, strong undertone of not consuming too much news. Like often they would limit the sorts of news articles that you would have at five or three and kind of say, that's enough news for you for the day, time to move on, um, which I found kind of interesting. Um, but often what it was was a blend of sort of aggregation, editorial and automation. So aggregating a number of news sources into one space um, providing some kind of light editorial or in some cases heavy editorial um, and seemingly automation. So um, that, that screenshot there of, of Insider demonstrates how uh, the AI is kind of looking at the, the headlines or the, the first paragraphs, first three paragraphs um, in many cases of, of what it's seeing and then trying to interpret and summarise what was going on. 
One of the most interesting ones, I think, was Charlie. So uh, it's, got a, it's got a very much, um, it has a, uh, an interface which wants to become uh, your friend. Um, it's pretty open in terms of, you know, there's a bunch of us working behind the scenes. We're not taking your data. We don't want you to sign in. You know, we assign you a, a user, an anonymous user. Um, you you kind of choose what you'd like to see and what you hear. Um, uh, yeah, so <laughs> it stepped you through the good things. Then also, um, you know, uh, <laughs> just demonstrating a conversation I had there, you know, uh, do you want the good and the bad things? Great, you know, here's the good things. We don't track you. What are the bad things? Uh, I'm still learning. I'm not strictly private. I have two human engineers who can see my conversations. Uh, just don't tell me any secrets, right? And so then we started sort of interacting around news things, and that was pretty much, it was okay. Like, you know, it was giving me, responding to, to certain things. Um, but you could see the limitations of, of these sorts of interactions where um, you can see that one screenshot there where I've kind of asked it a question, which it probably doesn't have the, the syntax for, you know, are threads useful? This was happening at the day that, you know, threads became the alternative Twitter or whatever. Um, and uh, that was it. That was the end of the conversation. Just kind of, it's, it's like a rude door slamming in my face almost of, you know, that I've reached my end. Um, so, so it started to sort of paint this picture around there's, int there's interesting applications for this. There's a blend of, of humans and non-humans going in this sort of space. But what I think is most important, which I think my, and my colleagues will pick up on as well, is the capacity for news to reach new audiences in new kinds of ways. Um, and the significant work that, or the potential of these spaces where um, it's a way to reach new audiences and translate or can, can give it additional context for new audiences. So for example, um, with young people or uh, people who are you know, not news junkies in that kind of way. Um, that's it, I'll leave it there for today and pass over to to Craig. Hi everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Craig, so I'm from the ABC and I work in digital product. Uh, I used to work in news um, for a long time and so a lot of my interest is still in news and we have a focus there. Uh, so I'm just going to give you an overview of some of the projects we've done in this area. Um, I'm going to try and get through as quickly as I can because the conversation um, on this panel could be great. And so I'm just going to you know, take you through Newsbot and a few of the other projects we've done since. Um, but first, this is sort of a bit of the overview of what I'm uh, what, how I feel like this is structured. First, we had web, so we, had, we launched the website in the 90s. Search came along, and that was something you had to get your head around back then, the idea that you'd appear in the search. Before that, it was directories, and we had search. Then along came social, again, a different way of people getting content and that emerged, and mobile emerged then too. And so I think that was the period where I was like, looking at all the stats and seeing the growth in uh, group messaging, people sort of leaving social, getting into group messaging, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, and there was a real massive growth there and there were a lot of Australians in Messenger um, and WhatsApp. So we were also looking at how to reach new audiences, especially those who are getting their news in social media um, as just part of their feed. They weren't seeking out news. So we're looking to you know, attract a more younger, more female audience and bring some of those social audience in. So we're looking for solutions in, in the messaging space. So that was sort of the driver. And uh, then I'd say, you know, this is the next phase, it would, is conversational experiences. And that goes, you know, beyond mobile, you're going on to smart speakers and smart TVs and, and other devices that haven't come up yet. I mean, for uh, Metaverse to work, you need to be talking with avatars uh, in the Metaverse space. So the same technologies are going to keep on rolling through and seem to be the core pinning. You know, this, uh, this conversational AI uh, is a core pinning through a lot of the technologies. So I think it's an important one to focus on because it does change relationships between organisations and people and between people and people. So first, our first attempt at this was with WhatsApp. Uh, it was, this was entirely human. And um, this was just a test to see how the ABC, like trying a different style of content, in this case, what was it, the Emmys, or um, um, we've got a budget example here, but we're, we're trying events 
and then there was a demand for breaking news. And so it was entirely people driven, but what we saw was people adding the ABC into their group chats as a conversation starter. Um, and so that was really interesting. The ABC was perceived as a person uh, that could be in a group of people just talking, th talking about things. And that sort of goes to one of the risks with a big movement into group messaging is that that is echo chambers, people talking amongst themselves about topics with not much diversity thrown in. Um, you know, perhaps we could have a role in there. We could get into those spaces where people were discussing news. Um, but yeah, that was successful, but it grew too large. Like the, it was quite a manual process to send breaking news messages out to the subscriber list because we ended up having 15, 16, 17 subscriber lists. Um, and then uh, face, we, we heard about Facebook's messenger platform and so that was sort of like, oh, we can automate some of this. So AI wasn't the prime directive of this. It was to be in these spaces and engage in this more natural way and sort of the technology sort of evolved at the same stage. And so then we, uh, I'd also add that we also had twi Twitter bots too that had been built by another team in news for the election. So you could ask it questions about the election. And we got information from doing that, from what were the other things people asked. I mean, you get election results and facts about prime ministers uh, that, had been, that had been done. But we got uh, a set of, you know, what, what were the questions people would ask us out of that, um, thinking it was automated. And we found a set of them that we could actually do. You know, like, you know, what's the latest news? What's the latest news for Sydney? What's the weather? What's the latest sport? Like, there was a bunch of simple things, so we felt we could do enough of it to have a crack. At, you know, there was a bunch of stuff we couldn't answer, but the core of it was stuff we thought we could do with automation. And so we built the messenger bot, and um, the reaction was quite um, astounding. Like, it, it's had, it had tens of thousands of, fee of pieces of feedback uh, we, we, had a lot, we had a long test process, we did it internally and gradually released it because there were little things like just using someone's name at that stage, you know, hi Craig, here's the news, it was a little bit freaky uh, to, to do that for the first time. And so we did test everything and we, our, our audience insights team ran um, research on it and we found like for, particularly for the, the younger female group, it would, they were loving it, um, the people we were testing with. So the feedback was really strong. and. Uh, so then, yeah, we had a, a small team of journalists working on it. Um, we couldn't do all the fancy automated stuff. We did this sort of by hand, so they crafted the flows. Um, and they explored new ways of telling stories. They explored the threading and the conversational style. And that led to watching what was happening and the feedback that came in so immediately, because it's a two-way medium, uh, led, it, led everyone to sort of feel like they'd seen things that couldn't be unseen. There was a new way of communicating out there that was quite rewarding. And so it was, it, it was interesting because they were training, say, radio journalists, journalists to do it. And I would say, argue that radio is the more, most conversational medium. And they were going, wow, this is really quite different again in, in that you really get rewarded for being personal. Now, not everyone liked that. Some people wanted a more formal style. And potentially we can do that with generative AI in the future. Not now. We're not doing that now. Um, but we had one style, we chose you know, the, uh, your newsy friend in your pocket, the person who'd tap you on the shoulder and tell you something. Uh, notifications were a big deal with this too, the ability to push messages out. So we had quite fine-grained, you know, same-sex marriage was an issue then, so you could subscribe to quite detailed and we'd send you more conversational messages. And they pop up in your phone with your friends and we're alerting you to news. We also had journalists covering things like the budget, um, US elections, events like that. And so as it went on, the bot evolved into more of a, like a radio host. It was hosting these personalities or these people we'd introduce you to and you could subscribe and get updates from them on particular topics. And that connection is really important. We've talked about, a few panels have talked about that, but we're using the AI to match what you're asking um, as well as quite physical, you know, sending these messages out uh, so that you could have a more human interaction and it was the conversational style and the tone and the relationship that was really important. Uh, as since then, like if we get to the what's the news, I'll just go hey assistant in this case because we're uh, across all the, the three major platforms at the moment. We've done news briefings fairly early on and so some of those are crafted. Uh, that was the sort of first step, so it's just like a news briefing, a finance briefing, a sport briefing. And the idea was that you'd sort of choose your briefings from different providers on these platforms and go, hey, what's the news? 
and get a, a set of briefings. Now we've got local news there, we had sport, we had quite a few little categories, but everything went to the big national news. And I guess you always see this, people don't change the defaults, you know, what they get, they sort of leave it there and it, it got hard. That modular approach was attractive, but it didn't really work because there's too much effort. So both Google and Alexa moved to uh, sort of experiment with long form um, sort of news where Google was trying to do it algorithmically where it would get stuff from all providers and then generate a playlist for you of, of news that uh, could be infinite but you know it knows what the big stories are with the Google News algorithm, they'd be up front and go to more featurey longer stuff as you went. Now that didn't really pan out, Google sort of did that around the world and it, uh, they sort of pulled back on it um, but um, Alexa introduced news channels and so it'll suggest a few news providers and we're one of them and then we've got um, a team in news who curate what we call news stream. It's all modular standalone pieces of audio which uh, they update during the day. And at the front of it is the briefing. So that's kind of worked out. We reuse the briefing, here's the overview of the news and then it goes into these longer, more detailed stories. Um, and I'll show you a, a, just a, a graphic of that. And that's both audio and video. So on screens you get the video version and on, on speakers you get the audio version. Um, and then we also did during uh, coronavirus with the ABC Coronacast and in that case Alexa, we got asked Alexa Amazon and they mapped that to people asking about uh, coronavirus that would go to Coronacast. Uh, a bit of a blunt instrument but effective and uh, in the UK I think they used Reuters was answering questions about coronavirus. So they mapped all those phrases that, pe that people would ask to uh, a service, hard mapping it. And this is uh, Newstream, so this is a concept I think will get even more powerful as we move into generative AI, audio and video, is that, you know, it's personalised media. Um, you know, with Spotify, they've got the Spotify AI DJ now. In the middle of those things, you know, in their case, in the middle of music tracks, they're, they're, they're generating facts about the music and they've got a synthesised voice doing it. But we actually haven't found that's necessary with new, new stream. People quite like that it's just the news. But the stories have been crafted to be standalone. They don't need a, a, a typical radio introduction. Um, and there's podcasts, shorter podcasts in there too. So it's things that were created in the podcast medium are now going back into a more of a streaming medium. So uh, it's a really interesting area. And all we've got is Skip at the moment. That's mostly enough. You could do more web-like linking behaviour potentially in the future. Um, BBC did explore that. And uh, not to forget the kids, we also do kids news. So as a kids briefing and then we've also launched an ABC kids skill and in the mornings that has news in it. So it introduces, you know, do you want to hear the news? And then we've got specialised kids news in there and you can access that independently as well if you put it in a briefing. So a bit of customization there that increases the you know, access, of kid, well, access for kids to news. And I would say too that the news bot was, we've got a lot of feedback of it being used in schools. That, which is, that was you know, really heartwarming to hear. Uh, ABC Emergency is another style of thing where after the, after the floods and the fires and people complaining all the time about not having a central source of emergency information, um, this is, uh, we, we actually built a, a database inside the ABC working with the emergency agencies of all the, it's a live database of all the emergency information from across the country pulled into one format so that then out of that we were able to do, hey uh, you know, Alexa, are there any emergencies near me? Are there emer any emergencies near postcode 4069 or a place name? And then we'd aggregate all the information uh, for those emergencies for a, a radius area. And, uh, yeah, and that's configurable too, so you can say how far. But it means you can ask, you know, if you've got relatives across the country or, you know, at all times it's up to date. It's it doesn't use generative AI, it uses templates, so we've had a person design those templates, reaches in, grabs the data, changes it based, you know, if there's multiple fires, there'll be, you know, there, there, there's things, a lot you can do without generative AI, it's, but it's work, it's hard work. Um, and then, but basically at the end of it, you've got a service, and we can build that service into other things too, once you've got it. Like, theoretically, we haven't done it, um, but say at the front of Newsstream, you could generate an up-to-date 
emergency and weather service for people that as soon as they ask for it is up to date. But we haven't done that, no plans for it at the moment, but that's the type of thing you can do when you've got the flexibility of data and you know, AI or programming. Um, this is just a schematic of the service we built that we called Aurora. So it's got all localised information in it, so data sets. So it's got the ABC's radio regions in it. It's got all the locations across the country. Then it's got emergency data, elections, um, weather, and we can keep on adding to that. You can go in, so it can give you a national view, but you can also go into it via a localised view. And I think that's an important concept. And that's powering a bunch of things across the ABC. So any, if there's national data sets that have local relevance, you can reach in, pull that data out locally or combine it in different ways. News stories, you know, you can grab news stories from an area based on location. And then finally I'll end up on, this is you know, the key thing that everyone loves about ChatGPT, but answering questions. And I think we're just seeing that before, that you can hit the limits. It's a, it's a, for an uh, organisation as big as the ABC, what we found with uh, the uh, messenger bot is the range of questions is massive. And also a lot of them you, do, uh, you don't want to answer. Like you need filters, you, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to go into place to do question answering. But the fundamental thing here is that, yeah, you can't answer everything. We're not Wikipedia, we're not an encyclopedia, we're a news service and that's got finite resources. And you've, we have to be accurate, we have to be up to date. So we've looked at this a few times. And um, there are us, like, how can we do question answering? And we've done, uh, out of Messenger, we did develop a culture of asking questions because the, you get this really rich set of information about what people want and how they'll ask for it. And uh, that's an example of an article that came out during coronavirus. We were collected, we turned that systematic question gathering into a bit of an art. Um, but you can never really answer all these questions. So potentially, well, I don't know how it works, but you know, potentially generator AI answer, helps us do that vast bulk, uh, you know, deal with the vast bulk of questions that come in because we can only answer a subset at the moment. So yeah, the challenges with question answering, which Damiana can probably go to because this is sort of a search question as well. But first one, you need to identify the questions. You need to find out what people want to ask and how they will ask it. Um, Google's probably, it would really be really good at this, but yeah, it's really broad. Uh, you have to be able to ensure you have up-to-date, accurate answers. You can't give the wrong answer about coronavirus uh, as a news organisation. Again, that's a hard problem um, to do that for everything. You can do it for some things. You have to focus. Um, you have to, in our, in our thing, especially when going to on a, onto a smart speaker and going away from articles, you have to ensure you've got the balance and context required to meet our editorial guidelines. If we just give, say, the first three paragraphs, it might leave something important out from down below. There are these legal considerations. So respecting legal sensitivity, court, crime, investigations, these are tricky areas and every word gets legaled. And so you can't just throw that to a word munching machine and spit it out again. Um, and then, yeah, answers need to work as text and audio um, and not answer what we can't or shouldn't. You need to block stuff potentially coming back or coming in because there is a wide range of it and some of it's uh, pretty horrible. So that's what, you know, ChatGPT has to deal with and we all have to deal with that too. But it's uh, when you've got a broad, wide organisation, you'll get a lot of stuff. So I'm just going to leave it on that because uh, that's a big question. Uh, it's one of the most exciting areas to be able to answer anyone's question on any topic from any dimension. Um, but it's tricky. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Craig. Perfect segue for what I have to say, but I don't have good news. Like it's, it's indeed a, a very hard problem. It's good news for us because that means that we can do more research. Um, but yeah, uh, imagine that you have, or yeah, you are sitting on the couch and looking, watching your favorite influencer on YouTube in your smart uh, TV, and then your, your favorite influencer is saying, well, this, this rice milk is the good deal. Like the rice milk, forget about any alternative meals, you need to have rice milk and you suddenly have a, an information need. Hang on a second, I want to know what is 
the pros and cons of this rice milk? Is it really uh, a good thing or is it just uh, greenwashing? Is it good for the planet really or I need to find out that? So then you are too lazy to type on your, on your laptop uh, through the Google search and you use your smart speaker to ask that question and say, uh, what's, what's the pros and cons of uh, rice milk? Or what are the advantages? Is rice milk healthy? And here you already can see that there are multiple ways you can rephrase uh, phrase that information need and there are a couple of posters you haven't seen on query variations. Uh, and then, so there is a lot of things that can go wrong there, no? Because there is a lot of uncertainty. So the system is going to try the best, as you just mentioned, the best guess of understanding what are you trying to, what to satisfy that information need and what you are trying to actually want to know. And then there is a lot of information that needs to aggregate to give you that information, then how to present that information to make sure that you have a good balance of the pros and cons. Should I first uh, uh, give you a, an audio that tells you about the pros or the cons before? Do I need to synthesize the answer to show a balance? So the problem in it, if you if you have an, an audio channel or the trick that we use in search engines uh, on screens is that that uncertainty is not giving the right answer. No, if I have uncertainty, I, I still have a good way of dealing with that, which is I show you a ranking, and the agency is on the user to decide which search result you want to click to know more. In in audio, you, you have less opportunities to do that because it's like a linear channel. So. And then on the other side, you have all the uncertainties from the user side. So we really don't know 100% what the user wants, but also there is the, uh, the background of the user. No? So we have the uh, uh, cognitive biases, and here is not necessarily bad, but we have different backgrounds, different understanding of what, uh, what we know about that topic and what we expect to see or what we want to hear and what we really need to hear. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. So in the, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a workshop on one of the uh, conferences of, for human information, uh, interactive information retrieval that looked at the understanding how searchers and systems and how that interaction uh, happens. Like I, I really like the, the concept of a communi communicative AI that we saw in the, in your, uh, in, in the, um, lecture yesterday and that is exactly the whole uh, point of uh, in that conference on that forum like the interaction is the protagonist no and then we in that uh, conference we had a workshop on future conversations and the idea was to have different uh, researchers and with uh, different statements talking about the, the the problems that we have in conversational uh, uh, search and then understanding what are what trying to find like what are the next steps no and uh, one of the uh, uh, research groups in um, uh, Bauhaus Universitat uh, Weimar in Germany, uh, Johannes Kiesel and, and, and his uh, colleagues were talking about argumentative search and conversational argumentative search. And in my background, my research, I'm interested in understanding the fairness and cognitive biases that are characterizing that, trying to do a bias aware conversational search. So then we say, well, let's, I think we, we are trying to look at the same problem from different lenses, let's put our ideas together and we wrote this provocation paper where we bring a lot of problems but not many solutions. <laughs> uh, and, that, and, and this, uh, this uh, figure that you can see here is a summary of the research questions that we have. No? So for, for instance, if you look at uh, research question one, it's like uh, looking at how can the user and the assistant understand each other and then you can, uh, think of investigating the short and long term e effects and the uh, uh, mental models uh, or develop privacy aware uh, interaction guidelines uh, to, to uh, address this uh, research question. Uh, there are other research questions that look at uh, explainability. So the assistant, because needs to make the decision of aggregating different information, is, is going to make a proactive decision on how to select the information that needs to give as an answer and that uh, also has like what we call argu argumentative selection bias, no? So there is something there that is probably here is where, where the interaction with the 
the editorial part comes in, no? like you might make decision of what is the thing that you want to select, and that could be different for different news providers or different uh, uh, service providers. But again, like understanding how the system can give more transparency on how those decisions are made is something that uh, we could study. And the, uh, there are questions about personalization and, and then uh, a better presentation and interaction strategies and characterizing that bias to make it not to solve the bias because by definition, if you have a, all the systems that we use, they are biased and it's good that they are biased because if you have a search engine that doesn't give you a ranking that is biased, so you have a random ranking, you don't want to have that, you don't want to interact with a system. Of course, not all the biases are good. So what we need is more uh, uh, what we hear, hear, heard before, no? So not solving the problem, but understanding the problem. So what we want is to characterize uh, bias. And then we have, um, and this is what we are trying to do in the, uh, one of the projects that we have in the center that is looking at quantifying and measuring bias and engagement. Uh, and we, we've been, uh, for instance, uh, in the context of research question four and, and five that is looking at uh, how can the system compensate for the user cognitive biases. So making uh, uh, actions to help the user to uh, deal with those biases and uh, how can the, the system help to identify, the user identify those biases so to make really like to uh, make a better interaction and a cooperation between the user and the system. When I say system, I refer to the smart speaker. I know that it's a, one of the keywords that in different disciplines we, we mean different things, but yeah, in the context of information access or computer science systems, it's typically looking at the, the actual uh, algorithm. Um, so for instance, uh, our, our PhD student, Sachin Patija and Cheru Manal is looking at how to present multiple arguments that we have like that example of pros and cons. How do you present, what is the presentation strategy that is more effective to deal with those, uh, uh, to those biases? So is it, for instance, we know that uh, presentation bias is when you look at the ranking, we know that we start looking at the first search result, then second search result, if there's a cascade model. That's not necessarily the case when you are listening to search results because maybe the way our memory works is like we might memorize or give more weight in the way we consume that information to the first one that we heard and the last one. So looking at those, uh, making those um, different ways of presenting the pros and cons and trying to understand how the user interacts with those and looking at the different viewpoints that the user has of or wants to hear or, or believes that needs to hear and that's the effect and quantifying that is something that uh, Sachin is looking at. And so there's a poster on that as well. And then uh, another case of looking at uh, how the, the impact of presentation strategies might have when we uh, interact or when we consume complex information is the, in the context of fact checking. So uh, Danula was briefly uh, mentioned that in the, in the panel that we have on fact checking, but we are looking also at understanding how you can present complex information like the verified content that our colleagues from MIT Fact Lab uh, prefer in a, such a li limited bandwidth channel that we call, no? So it's an audio, like it's like looking at trying to present all that complex information and consuming it with a straw because it's a linear channel. So how do you do that? And what are the presentation strategies? Uh, uh, and that is where really that's not on we need this cross-disciplinary collaboration to, to really understand because we are not experts in communication strategies, but how you can develop algorithms or system that can uh, embed those presentation strategies for voice is, is another uh, complex or a rich open question. And finally, the, the, the other uh, project that I wanted to pitch is really looking at uh, measuring and quantifying those characterizing those uh, actions or those activities that are happening in the interaction with uh, screens or audio uh, systems, audio-only systems, so reading, listening, writing, and speaking, how we can characterize what's going on there in the interaction 
with uh, using sensors to characterize physio to collect physiological signals and trying to understand if that is telling us something about those biases and that interaction. Um, so there is another poster uh, by Kashinji that uh, is looking at the, the long-term uh, plan is to looking at using physiological signals that can tell us about confirmation bias in, the, in those interactions. But of course, that is such a complex uh, scenario that you need to narrow down and start looking at the individual <coughs> facets that are uh, the different stages that are um, in, involved in that in that setting. So we have a, a short paper at the top conference of uh, the field of information retrieval, CIR, that is going to be uh, happening in a couple of weeks in, in Taipei, Taiwan, where we look at, okay, so it, how we, so the, the, the way we are looking at this is uh, with laboratory user studies and trying to collect all these physiological signals with participants where we, we use multiple uh, wearable devices. No? So typically in, in the field of information retrieval, we look at, for instance, understanding how people interact with search engines using eye trackers. But when you go to other modalities, I, the GR tracker is not going to be very useful for audio, right? So can we use other wearable devices to try to understand what's going on in the interaction? So we are looking at uh, using wristbands that uh, collects other physiological signals. And uh, soon we are going to try using uh, um, headsets that collects also like the uh, electrical activity in the brain. So I, I like to refer to this, this setting as the inspector gadget because we have the participants with all these gadgets uh, and trying to understand what's going on there. And this uh, hopefully will tell us more about understanding how the information is uh, consumed and back and forth. No? So we have the, the one of the key uh, things in conversational uh, interaction is like for complex information uh, uh, tasks, you might not be able to give the whole information in one interaction. So you have multi-current interactions and that makes the whole thing even more complex. What happens with memory of the, what you, you presented before, what's happened with the, the idea of summarizing the different information and, and digesting different information so to help the user satisfying the information need. So it's a very ambitious plan, but I think uh, uh, we are doing, doing little steps uh, towards better understanding the and characterizing that interaction with uh, intelli intelligent assistants or smart speakers. That's all what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, great insights, presentations, thoughts, uh, products, and everything. And uh, before going to the audience questions, we have a couple of questions already. I would like to start first with a question that I have, and especially when we were preparing this, com this uh, session, we were saying, okay, well, let's talk about conversational journalism. And after looking your presentations uh, about uh, using the word interactions, using the word conversation, uh, can we really use the word conversation to describe our interactions with a uh, news assistant? So this is for all of you. I would just go first to say <laughs> we got to command, but what we saw coming in, like the complexity of what people would ask for, like a lot of things in one go. People are very complex when they speak. When you see that raw stuff coming in, in the old system, I was like, I can't deal with that. I can't train the AI to pull that apart and get meaning from it to find the intent, because you're trying to get one intent, get news or and, and trigger your um, your system to do what it was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and getting, if we got three steps in, people would be really impressed. If they, you know, they got a, if they said something, got a response, and then had another response, they were pretty impressed then. But it's not really conversational. And that's where ChatGP, you know, seeing, experiencing that was mind-blowing. It's like, I never thought we would get to that. Not for a long time. So it's a within grasp. I don't know how we exactly grasp it with all the caveats that we have, but it's within grasp now, whereas previously, including with Alexa and everything, it was command-driven. People only do it really, oh, 
uh, Amazon don't quote me, <laughs> but they do a few things with it. The things that they know and are reliable, like getting music or hopefully news. Um, but there's only a few big things because it's hard and it's not always reliable and it makes mistakes. But when you get to things that work, it's great. But yeah, not conversational yet. Thank you. Um, uh, sorry to everyone's assistants that are buzzing in their their pockets and bags and things at the moment. I just was thinking before about how many times it's probably triggered um, things in the room. Um, one of the things that became really commonplace while I was doing some of the exploratory work on on this next round of uh, of news bots is the still the strong um, editorial control i guess is a good word to to use here on the content that's going out right so uh often in in most of these apps there would be um a, a disclaimer somewhere saying hey this is experimental or hey this is not you know what's said we probably you know some mistakes can be made or whatever and certainly in the context of the abc right it's it's got to be branded abc which ha has a particular you know a, a remit and lots of values and things behind it, all the all the good things of public media. Um, so I think there's still this gap between, you know, like w where where the the potential is or where, where we're at at the minute and the sorts of things that can that are being said and to the extent that sort of brands or businesses will will be able to to stand behind them and go, yeah, we're ready to let go and let the let the G chat GPT rip or in, in that sort of thing. So we're not there in the conversational space yet, but we're working towards it. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with what uh, you two said. Um, I think it depends on what, what do you mean by conversational, no? So if it's about understanding the the need of the user, so some needs are easier to understand. What's the weather? This is the weather, that's it. So if the conversation is one turn, <laughs> So, but if you mean conversation on mul multiple turns, so that's where things get trickier. I think it also you can think of um, conversational assistance as for different contexts, no? Like you have the entertainment conversation assistant, and it reminds me of Eliza, like the psychologist that was really not doing much, but the interaction was, uh, what do you mean by, how do you feel today? Uh, what do you, why you feel that way? So it's like not really having a conversation, but at the same time, having the conversation that was like a decades ago, no? But uh, uh, if you think of um, information seeking conversational, so it depends on the the complexity of the information need. So if it's something simple or yeah, one way you can, you might be able to answer, like the, yeah, give me the, uh, the, the kids. I remember f uh, a friend of mine having the kids using the smart speaker to listen to music so they they don't have the youtube screen no so then if you want to play baby shark so probably the, the system will satisfy the information need if it's more complex like com com pro, uh, controversial topics or multiple correct answers or that's uh, that's the space where where we we are not there definitely yeah thank you we have a uh, yeah now we have questions so I have uh, one here, like it was formulated nine minutes ago. Uh, when you are giving answers in the Q&A format, what measures are in place to rate whether an answer is truthful or considering uh, biases? I guess this is also for Damiano, no? <laughs> yeah, so tra traditionally, like in question answering, you have, I mean, the way that the methodologies that we use to evaluate this type of systems heavily rely on, on quantitative methods and basically having a reference of what is a correct answer and that, again, like uh, what we heard today, no? So everything, all the technology is human. So then the ground truth of or, or the labels that sell, sell for this question, this answer is true. Someone is making that judgment and then understanding what are the the assumptions made on that uh, on that on those annotations or those so we have mechanisms of defining guidelines to make a relevant judgments on on that space and but definitely like there are some limitations there but is assuming that someone gives you a correct answer then you have metrics that you can test and uh, that you can use to understand how close th the answer of a system is to the reference answer 
and then there are other so that would be like the one of the dimensions relevance other dimensions are like well if you have multiple answers so then how do you uh, um, measure fairness for instance no? like and then there are different metrics at the end at the end of the day so there are always human decisions made on the instruments that they use to uh, to measure these things and i think there is a there are some uh, work on on characterizing those measures and, and doing meta evaluation for instance to understand or characterize these properties of different metrics and 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 guidelines or annotation guidelines but definitely there is room for doing more there Thank you. If you have any, no. Okay. Yeah, I would just say, yeah, with that example I had at the, like my last slide was, you know, it's an article that we're doing as an, uh, pretty much as an FAQ. So mm -hmm. finding the most often asked questions or the most interesting asked questions and journalists answering them. Mm -hmm. um, and I was hoping to use that, like that was probably the best bet for doing question and answering in a bot form was to turn that into structured data, into some type of knowledge base. But even then, in talking to the journalists, their ability to keep those, to stand behind it, to make sure it was always up to date, um, that was that was hard. And that's also one of the requirements. But yeah, w before, you know, now with the generative AI technologies, perhaps we can we can do something more easily with that. But yeah, before we were just looking at turning it into an FAQ format, a machine readable FAQ format, and having um, having the bot reach in and match the question mm -hmm. to the question in the FAQ and, and pull it out. But there's still lots of process issues and that's not really how a newsroom's set up to work. Um, you know, they're, they're writing articles. Those articles you know, turn over sort of each day on the topics and you have a backlog of articles, but they're not designed to answer questions as such. You can probably pull questions out, but the joy is when you get a, like, especially from something like ChatGPT, when you get a really accurate answer to your exact question, um, that's when it feels great. Um, not when you've got sort of some half, you know, like Google Answers, sort of half your sort of question. Um, it's really magic when it gets it exactly right. But yeah, it's um, monitoring, you know, generative AI for its ability to do this, but still using, you know, journalist written answers. But I don't know how that works out in the long run. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a north star. I guess I, I would just respond to to that question just again to highlight the the humanness of the whole process, right? So, um, so there's still you know there's there's generative AI, but there's still a human you know very much involved in that process, right? So, um, so this is I guess it just places a question over the whole the whole process here of you know to what extent is is generative AI a journalistic tool in that regard, as opposed to uh, an entire solution in, in many ways. Yeah. Thank you. We have um, another question. I, I don't know which one to choose, but <laughs> there are so many. Um, OK, so for Craig or others, what is the uh, smart uh, speaker adoption rate and usage for news? Are ABC audiences using this technology for news consumption regularly? Uh, yeah, I would say regular. Um, the the news stream's doing quite well. I haven't got the exact figures. The uh, latest research that we saw, I think, was 28% uh, penetration to Australia of smart speakers, which, was, which is static on last year. Um, so we do monitor that, and it has. And in the US, it's sort of slowed down in the 30% mark, which is still a large, pretty large audience in the US. Um, so yeah, it does. It's it's slowed down. Um, and that was concerning, but again, the new technologies. Uh, Amazon said it was already using a generative AI, but they're building a much bigger one. Okay. And Google's merged their Bard and Google Assistant teams um, to be working on the one thing. So, you know, smart speakers is still pretty clumsy to use. So I'm, I'm hoping to see, you know, like that they get better out of this and that, that kicks that take up as well. Um, and yeah, that, that's connected with smart home as well. And also they're using cars. I mean, Mercedes has added ChatGPT to their voice stack in the car as a beta. Um, could be just publicity, could be interesting. Um, but yeah, about, I think it's about 28%. But yeah, we do see regular usage of news and we'll be getting some more data soon on, on radio use, which will be interesting too, because mm -hmm. that's, you know, it's, it's the new radio in the home in many ways. 
Um, but yeah, we do see regular use of news in there from of those um, briefings and um, the stream in particular. Um, the next question is from uh, David Nolan. I wonder if there are different and not necessarily commensurable definitions of bias in play here, and uh, if this is a problem. Definitely, yes, there are multiple uh, confound <laughs> definition of bias. I don't think it's a problem. I think it's an opportunity. Uh, I think, uh, um, yes, it, it, it highlights the need of, of characterizing it no? and, and the needs of better understanding of yeah, what do we mean by confirmation bias or selection bias. Um, there, there are um, other type of biases that are coming from the statistical bias, like in the <laughs> in the experiments that we run, in the uh, probabilities that the system is uh, trying to guess when aggregating different information, retrieving the information. So all that is a complementary angle of bias that is also uh, different from the one that we are talking about when we try to understand what's going on in the interaction. But I think it's a, an opportunity to, like that diversity is something that we should embrace in terms of to to understand, to better understand what is happening in this space. Thank you. Any thoughts? Um, another question, is the data coming into the ABC emergency bot shared with the newsroom in real time to help them cover breaking news more quickly? Uh, they're pretty much already on top of it. Like we've got the, because uh, we've also got an, um, an emergency team um, who, who work with uh, the, lo well, the local radio and the emergency agency. So we've got a team that's dedicated to that. And they, they do use that information that goes, they've got a dashboard on that as well. But they generally across the stuff anyway. But yeah, they do monitor, the, like we've got it on the website, we've got a big map as well of all the emergencies going on in the country. Um, and so, yeah, that, that does help, like the emergency teams cover it. And then we've also built it, the same functionality into the header of the new site, so you'll get emergency updates as well. And then we'll, there's a ticker on the website too that we'd probably look at, but that would go through a journalistic, uh, you know, they decide to put that up or not. Um, and yeah, there's a few automation things we can do, but generally the newsroom flows and everything, they're across this type of stuff. <laughs> There are many questions for you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> All the people want to know uh, what happens uh, at ABC. So can the ABC accurately track the ways in which its, its content is being accessed by the full range of different crawlers uh, and uh, scrapers uh, utilized by conversational bots? Uh, I'm not sure on that one. On conversation, there, there's, um, we've got the scrapers for um, things like BARD, and so they're using sort of like webmaster tools, so you can block them from scraping. But yeah, I'm not across those details on the website of what people are tracking. I mean, we've, we've got dashboards for what happens in Alexa, and then audio tracking, there's still a lot of work around that. But uh, yeah, the, w the tracking of the different crawlers and scrapers coming along, no, I'm not sure of, sorry. Okay. How do you see the Q&A with the news platforms being more valuable than simply asking Google or an updated model of ChatGPT in future? For you. <laughs> Thanks. For the three of you. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, again, coming back to the, the branded element of it, right? So, so like this prompts me from my own personal experience at home. So, so we have uh, we have a speaker, an Alexa in the in the main room, and uh, we have a we have a startup every day for that, which goes through you know we go through Sky, and then we go to ABC, right? It's like balance, right? Um, uh, but but through that process, there's you know there's branding that's that's happening in in this kind of space as well. And I think the issue with something like a, a Google aggregation is that it's kind of there's that loss of, um, that's probably from a, a media comms uh, perspective as well, there's that loss of understanding where the news sources come from because it is delivered to you as kind of an aggregated package. Whereas I think when you go to something, it's like, hey, ABC, what's the news? You know, you do, you do understand 
where it's coming from and, and how it's being packaged together and, and, um, and you know, the, the kind of brand affiliation that a, a user might have with a particular um, news supplier, um, I think is still really, really important as well. So. Yeah, I wanted to uh, add uh, in the in the workshop that we ran with uh, fact-checking pr practitioners to uh, understand how to uh, present the uh, pr design presentation strategies for screens and voice. That is something that came up as well. Like the so, for instance, they were highlighting the um, uh, the voice of the and the author and, and that connection that you have with the who is generating the content because you want to have keep having that for instance like they were uh, when we started the workshop we were thinking more multi-turn and like a type of google things and at the end what we got is something more like a podcast type of presentation where you have the narrative curated and and you know who is doing it and you trust that so i think it's it's a good point to to keep in mind yeah yeah i'd just say that uh we're likely to be more reliable faster more direct though it's the same thing like the chat gpt plugins I mean, if everyone starts using ChatGPT every day and that plug-in model, it'll be interesting to see. Like, it'll just be like when search came along and we had to work out how to optimize and integrate with Google. And then we had to work out how to optimize and integrate with all the aggregators uh, and, and social. Uh, that may happen again. We've got a couple of, you know, there's BARD and we'll have to work out because, you know, as large language models, you know, they're trained to a certain time at the moment. And so th this is sort of po potentially one of the interesting things. It's to get news in. That's more of a direct relationship. It's not, they've gone and aggregated the ABC's content and every other news providers. They've already trained it on that old content. But to get the new content in, there's new methods of pulling that in, uh, uh, ChatGPT plugins being one. And internally, we've made a, a plugin just to see what it looks like internally. Um, and there's some interesting challenges there in that you know, it, we do, we've got no control <laughs> over the content. You can tell it whatever you want it to do with the content and it will mix it up with other systems and pull it in. But uh, I still think coming to us, it'll be the more, most direct, reliable response um, that, you know, you know where you can go, you know you'll get it, you'll know we'll have it on those particular topics. But yeah, no, that, that's an evolving space. We'll have to adapt. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's 3.15, so we are right on time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.